Now, when it comes to the mesocycle itself, so typically a mesocycle is a collection of microcycles, about four to eight weeks in duration. That is not a concrete range, however, it can be less than four weeks, it can be longer than eight weeks. It all depends on how the client is responding and progressing over the course of several weeks. So what is the goal of this mesocycle? This is what is going through my head as I am creating the program. What is the goal? Is this mesocycle going to be focused on building muscle or is it going to be focused on building strength in a particular exercise? Okay. Remember, if I zoom out, this has to make sense. This mesocycle has to make sense as part of a long-term plan. There needs to be coherence between mesocycles. What variables am I going to prioritize in this mesocycle? Is it going to be volume? Is this going to be a high volume phase of training? What about intensity? What's intensity going to, going to look like if my volume is high? What if the goals are strength? Well, maybe intensity will be emphasized. Okay. In this case, I'm referring to absolute intensity. So the weight on the bar. What exercises are required? Okay, so first you have to establish what variables you're going to be emphasizing, whether it be intensity, volume. Okay, those are the two main ones. Then you need to work out what exercises are actually going to fit into this mesocycle. Okay, so if it's strength, if you want to get stronger with a specific exercise, you probably need to be doing that exercise and you need to be doing other exercises that have indirect uh, specificity to that main exercise. For example, if you want to get stronger at a squat, maybe doing a leg press is also a good idea because those two exercises are somewhat specific. They're not exactly the same, but there is specificity and the le leg press can transfer what we call indirect adaptations to the squat. Okay, you get stronger on a leg press, you build bigger quads, that's probably going to help you with your squats, right? After that, you need to identify how you will be progressing each exercise. Each exercise will come with different, um, will gravitate, sorry, towards different progression models. And we're going to get to that soon. What will be the anticipated length of the mesocycle? Okay, so it's important to have an anticipated length in mind because when you're progressing your exercises, well, you know, the, the harder you progress your exercises, the shorter the mesocycle is probably going to be, the more conservative you are with your progression models, then the longer the mesocycle is going to be. So you have to have somewhat of an idea on how long it's going to last. But again, there's no concrete number, right? Number of weeks. Now, again, this is probably one of the most important considerations you need to make when creating a mesocycle. How is this current mesocycle that I'm prescribing for my client capitalizing on the previous one? And how is it going to potentiate subsequent mesocycles? So you can't think of mesocycles as being individual. Remember, I said they need, there needs to be coherence evident throughout the macrocycle plan. So what I'm doing now needs to take advantage of what I did last week and needs to potentiate what I'm going to be doing in the future. So it needs to make sense. You can't just be training for hypertrophy one week. The next week, you're training for strength. The week after that, you're training to gain lean muscle. Some people say that. They're training to gain lean muscle. Don't even know what that means. But people do it. People change training goals up on a weekly, monthly basis. It's important to understand coherence is essential. And we need to take into account historical data and what we've done in the past and what we want to be doing in the future. Now, when you're creating a mesocycle, you obviously have to do a needs analysis. So this is when you question the client, when you ask the client all these questions. Okay, needs analysis needs to come before you actually write the program. I do a needs analysis before I write any program. Doesn't matter if I've been coaching the client for two years or a year or three years. Before every program, I reevaluate, like I mentioned earlier, and I ask the client, how has the program been going? I it retrieves some subjective feedback. Subjective feedback is important. And then I look at the objective data that I've recorded and try and uh, look for patterns, look for trends. That will help me with my decision making. So the thing is, the needs analysis, it holds everything together. Okay? Doesn't matter how much scientific evidence you have, 
how much personal anecdote you have. Okay, some coaches, they rely on anecdote exclusively. Anecdote doesn't mean anything if you're not taking into account your client's needs. Okay, so it's a cement that holds all those bricks together. So goals, timelines, client's current state. What's their current state at? What's their body fat percentage at? Level of advancement. What about their mental capacity to take on the training and nutrition protocols that you're prescribing? Their preferences, that's super important. So when it comes to preferences, it's important to balance between the client's needs and their wants. What they want is obviously what they prefer. But if you give the client too much of what they want, well, you're going to probably be taking away from the optimal adaptations that you're after here. Because to acquire those optimal adaptations, in most cases, you need to give the client what they need. So there needs to be a compromise. And to me, this is a collaborative approach to programming. So I have a tendency to be collaborative when I program for clients. So although I do display authoritarian qualities, okay, and as a coach, you probably should, you need to show the client that you're the authority, you still need to be collaborative. The client wants to do something, well, maybe it's worth compromising. If it's really not in their best interest to do, well, explain why, provide an alternative perspective, and try and come to somewhat of a conclusion uh, with the client's input. Training history as well, that's super important too. So this is what this is the information, sorry, you need to be retrieving in the needs analysis. Now, when it comes to implementing the meso cycle, this comes back to what I said earlier. We need to establish what is theoretically optimal for the individual's goals and balance that out with what is practically um, optimal. What can the client practically achieve? What are they capable of doing? So what we need to do is investigate the individual's current state and assess their ability to achieve the theoret theoretically optimal tasks. So in most cases, when I'm programming the meso cycle, I will try and shoot for what I think is theoretically optimal. Once I kind of create the program, I'll have a look through it and then I'll start fine tuning based on what I think the client can actually do. Okay. So if I feel they just, can't, they're not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to sustain it. I feel there are too many risks. I'm not super confident. I'll start cutting away, chopping and changing until I come to what I think is a good balance between the theoretically optimal and practically optimal. So this is what I do. It's laid out right there. Set parameters that are above their baseline. Okay. Above that red dotted line you saw earlier but within what is predicted to be their maximum performance capacity. All right. Now back to implementation, monitoring, and reevaluation. What we need to do when we're monitoring is we need to evaluate outcomes, investigate any barriers, confounding variables that may have arised, the execution of the program and the adherence. That's what, that's what I'm monitoring. Okay. That's what I'm monitoring on a mesocycle to mesocycle basis, potentially even a week, to week basis, okay? So has last week's training uh, produced the outcome I was after? Did they hit the double that I assigned for them on their squat? Were there any barriers, confounding variables that popped up on along, along the way that may pop up again? Did they actually execute the program? Did they do all their training days? Too often, clients will, uh, coaches will prescribe numerous training days for their clients and they're just not able to do all those training days. Okay, you need to make sure. That, so, for example, you're consulting with a client and you ask them, how many days can you train per week? And they say they can do mm, three to five days. If a client gives me a range like that, I'm always going to start off with three days. I don't care if they say that they'll try their best to do it. If they aren't confident with that initial response they give me, they don't say, I can do four days. I'm not going to give them more than what I think they're going to be capable of doing. So I always start with the bottom of that range. And then over time, if they prove to me they can actually execute the program, they can adhere to it, we can add in training days. That is how I monitor a program. When it comes to reevaluating it, what we need to do is consider these two um, factors here. So if no progress has been made 
over the mesocycle and adherence is high, so if they've nailed the program, well, you can increase towards theoretically optimal. So that red dotted line, you can bring upwards. Okay, they haven't made any progress at all, but they've done everything you've asked of them. Obviously, you're not doing what is you're not doing enough of what is optimal. So you need to push that baseline upwards. If no progress has been made and adherence is low, decrease towards what is practically optimal. So pull that red dotted line down a little lower. Okay, adherence needs to be upheld. If you're giving your clients stuff that they just can't do. They're not going to get anywhere, and that's not great from a motivational standpoint either. Okay, so give them what they can do over time, try and get closer to what is theoretically optimal. Now, here is how I'm going to be bringing in the theory and applying this practical perspective. Okay, so when it comes to exercise progression, what can we do? So, we've got rate of overload. I mentioned earlier. You can overload aggressively, you can progress your training aggressively, or you can take more of a conservative approach. So slow and fast. Now we've got single progression, double progression, and triple progression. Okay, so start thinking about that. You've already learned about this today. Okay, I heard Jacob mention this earlier. So he mentioned what single progression is, double progression, triple progression. Try and recall some of that information. Here are some examples. So with single progression, we only progress one variable sets reps or load one or the other throughout the message cycle only one is progressed so if we choose a load progression it'll look something like that each week sets and reps stay the same weight goes up now obviously this type of an approach is going to lend itself to specific exercises it's going to lend itself better to specific ex exercises can you add weight on a dumbbell side raise each week okay maybe you can but will your clients be able to? Probably not. So a single progression approach using load is probably not a good idea. Can you add reps each week on a side raise? Yes, but you're also gonna eventually hit the point where you just can't do any more reps. So what do you do after that? That's when you might take a double progression approach. So this is when you add reps first, you get to the point where you can't do any more reps, then you add some load. Works really well for some isolation movements, okay? With many of my clients who just aren't super strong, um, this is the approach I take. It's a slower rate of progression, but if we uh, extract six months worth of training data out of their spreadsheets, we will see progression, okay? The, the line will be going up that progression line will be going upwards, okay? It won't be shooting straight up, but it will be going up and that's all that matters, okay? So some exercises like a deadlift, like a squat, you can get away with single load progression, okay? It's probably a good idea trying to add weight each week, okay? Obviously within your adaptive capacity, but I'm trying to um, show you guys, I'm trying to exemplify the, the fact that some exercises will work best with specific progression models. Triple progression is even slower than double progression. Okay, so this is when you'll add reps, you'll get to the point where you can't do more reps with a specific load. So you then may add or you may add sets. You'll then keep progressing and you'll do the same thing again. If you added load previously, you'll add a set and you'll keep progressing on that same load within that same rep range, okay? So obviously a slower rate of progression, but some clients are going to require that. You need to come to, the, come to terms with the fact that some clients won't be able to add weight, add reps every single week. You know what? They don't even have to do that on a weekly basis. Jacob mentioned this. Progressive overload doesn't require you to add weight to, pro to, to literally progress on a weekly basis. As long as the clients are getting into the gym and not regressing, then they're probably going to be inducing a positive training effect. Over time, obviously, we need to be progressing, but don't get, wrap yourselves around the, um, the proclaimed fact that you need to progress every single week. It's not a fact, okay? it's false. So just don't get wrapped up in that type of mentality. 
Hey guys, Martin from JPS Health and Fitness here. Thanks for watching the video. This was a small snippet from our program design lecture as part of the Strength and Physique seminar which we hold. To know more about this seminar, see the link below and like the video if you enjoyed it or comment if you have any questions or would like other specific topics to be covered. Once again, thanks for watching and stay tuned for next week's video.